The subcommittee will please come to order. Good morning. One of the most promising areas of the U.S. economy involves the development, marketing, and sale of mobile and online applications, commonly known as apps. Today we're going to take a close look at how the apps economy is shaping our future as individuals as well as as a nation. And the chair now recognizes herself for an opening statement. When it comes to mobile application software, I'm reminded of the hit song by country star Loretta Lynn, We've Come a Long Way, Baby. From the 1970s cave age concept of conducting banking or uh, paying your utility bill by telephone, mobile apps have exploded in number and in sophistication. Today, there are apps to lose weight, quit smoking, examine your stock portfolio, review restaurants, watch videos, check up-to-date scores of your favorite sports teams, witness breaking news events worldwide, post on Facebook, tweet to the world in 140 character bursts, and on and on. According to a recent New York Times article, there were nearly 8,000 mobile apps in 2008. Today, there are more than 1.3 million, and they are multiplying rapidly. Consider this. It's estimated that nearly 100 movies and about 250 books get released worldwide every week. That compares to nearly 15,000 apps. The health industry is a good example of this astonishing growth. The Baltimore Sun recently reported that there are now more than 40,000 mobile health apps contributing to an $800 million global business. And experts say we're only beginning to scratch the surface of a brand new industry. Apps, of course, are software programs, small in size, that users load onto their mobile devices or use layered on top of a platform such as Facebook. But times have changed in a hurry. Thanks to increasingly more powerful mobile app devices and higher quality networks, today apps are purchased typically through an app store associated with a particular platform. The main platforms in today's app economy are Apple iOS, Google Android, uh, RIM BlackBerry, Microsoft Windows, Amazon Kindle, and Facebook. Approximately one-third of all apps are created by individuals or businesses with fewer than five employees. But both blue-chip companies and traditional brick-and-mortar stores now have an app presence as well, developed either in-house or outsourced to a contractor. App developers range in size from one-person shops to a large developer such as Zynga with nearly 3,000 employees. The revenues generated by apps uh, include the purchase of the app in-app purchases like game credits, in-app advertising, and app-enabled commerce, such as the purchase of goods and services through an app. As a result, a new term, the apps economy, encompassing all such commercial activity, has now become a part of mainstream America. Apple first launched the iPhone in 2007 and followed with the introduction of its app store in 2008, which opened with 500 available apps. Four years later, Apple says its, store offer, its stores offer an astonishing 600,000 apps, and according to its website, Google's Play Store offers a similar number. Today, an estimated 90 million U.S. consumers spend approximately 60 minutes per day accessing the Internet on their smartphones, while another 24 million U.S. consumers spend 75 minutes a day using the Internet on their tablets, much of this access being gained through the use of mobile apps. And if you think all of that sounds pretty impressive, well, consider this. Last Christmas on December 24th and December 25th, consumers downloaded a staggering 392 million apps. So as smartphone and tablet ownership continue to rapidly expand, current projections indicate the app economy will soon become a $100 billion a year business. In addition to the explosive growth of the apps economy in the U.S., the outlook for apps as an export looks bright as well. More than 20% of all apps downloaded in China last year were created by U.S. developers. Clearly, this tremendous innovation offers high hopes for our economy. According to a study commissioned by TechNet about a year ago, there were over 44,000 app-related positions open in the U.S. at that time. And here's another interesting finding of that survey. Research has found that app jobs, while located in the predictable places like New York and Silicon Valley, are actually dispersed throughout the country with an estimated two-thirds of all app-related employment falling outside of New York or California. So with that as a background, I'm very anxious to hear from today's panel. What have been the keys to the explosive growth and job creation in the mobile app economy? Are there federal policies that present a roadblock to the sector's growth and ability to create jobs? 
Are there policies the federal government should consider to foster further growth and job creation? And what's the outlook for both the, in, the immediate and long-term future? And while we're on the subject of roadblocks, we should remember how critically important wireless spectrum is in driving innovation in the mobile app sector. Mobile is the fastest area of broad, broadband connectivity, and Congress must continue to explore ways to free up additional spectrum. I commend Chairman Walden for the important work he's already done this issue, and I look forward to his spectrum hearing tomorrow. As for today's hearing, it could not be more appropriate entitled, Where the Jobs Are, There's an App for That. Because increasingly through American innovation and ingenuity, we're rapidly becoming a world where there's literally, literally an app for everything. And with that, I now recognize uh, my good friend and uh, my colleague from Los, from Los Angeles, Beverly Hills area. Uh, the, um, what's your name, Mr. Waxman? Just came here for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's an app to give you my name and the description of the cities that I represent. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, as we in Congress look for ways to accelerate uh, the job growth, it's essential to highlight growth industries and examine what makes them successful contributors to the national economic recovery. Although they barely existed five years ago, mobile apps have emerged as a particularly innovative part of the information technology sector in the United States, and they now play a major role in American life. More than half of Americans with cell phones own a smartphone, giving them the advanced capabilities necessary to download and utilize some of the several hundred thousand apps that exist for work, education, organization, e-commerce, and entertainment. These apps produce many benefits, like making us more productive, by being able to edit documents on the run, keeping us in contact with friends and family through social media, or even allowing us to carry around a whole library of good books on a single device. Mobile apps can also have life-saving functions, particularly in the area of health IT, where there exist apps that help individuals check their blood pressure and, uh, and or their glucose levels. One notable benefit of the booming mobile apps industry is its impact on employment. A February study commissioned by TechNet estimated that mobile, mobile app development supported 460,000 jobs nationwide, including computer and mathematical jobs in tech companies, non-tech jobs in the same companies, and jobs created outside the tech industry through spillover effects. These jobs have been critical to, my, to our home state of California, which has over 20 percent of the total jobs estimated by TechNet study. I'm pleased to see that Mobile apps jobs are quite geographically dispersed with benefits for many states and regions. With uh, smartphone adoption expected to keep rising both here and abroad, U.S. app developers have the opportunity to continue to grow, and continued growth in the mobile app sector should lead to more jobs. This hearing can help us understand what is needed to ensure this continued growth, but one step is essential. We must continue to emphasize technical and foreign language education so that existing and future companies in this sector have the personnel needed to be successful. A recent study concludes that emerging markets like Brazil, Russia, India, and China will drive demand for the next 10 million apps. Our app developers need to be able to develop products for these markets. At the same time, it's important to remember that although the app economy is a bright spot, our goal as policymakers must be enduring prosperity across all economic sectors. We must promote growth that restores middle class security and improves economic mobility for the poor. While we in Congress work to control the federal deficit, we also must continue to make targeted investments in education, innovation, and infrastructure that can benefit all sectors of the economy. On a day when Apple is announcing its new iPhone and uh, Samsung is getting the benefit of the spillover from its uh, legal victory uh, and more people are looking to see what's going to be available for Christmas shopping, uh, it's appropriate that today is the day we're holding this hearing. And I thank you, Madam Chair, for uh, convening the hearing. Thank you so much. 
And thank you, Mr. Waxman, and I will look for the Where's Waxman app later today in the app store. The uh, chair now recognizes so Close to Where's Waldo. <laughs> <laughs> I set you up good for that one. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Upton for five minutes. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, there, there are not a lot of bright spots, perhaps, in our overall all economy. But one of the brightest is the birth and the growth of the app marketplace. It's one of the most exciting areas of technology with tremendous growth in recent years, growth that experts agree that we can continue to see. It's hard to imagine life before the iPhone appeared five years ago or the iPad, which debuted just two years ago. Now these devices and the apps that we use are an essential part of our lives for sure. The Apple Store launched with only 500 apps in 08, but now offers over 600,000. Well, the Android Store offers over 600,000 apps as well. That's growth of 240,000%, and folks continue to buy these apps in staggering numbers. According to one industry group, there were more than 11 billion downloads of mobile apps in 2010, with projections that downloads are going to grow to nearly $77 billion, worth $35 billion by 2014. What's more exciting than the, than the explosive proliferation of these apps are the jobs that are being created. Everyone from large companies to small businesses, the stay-at-home mom, are developing these apps and generating income. Furthermore, the wealth being generated by apps isn't locked into one or two particular geographic areas. The highest concentration of app developers are in California and New York, but there is an app developer in nearly every town in between with approximately two-thirds of app-related employment falling outside of those two regions. So if you have the talent and you have a computer, you can develop an app and compete in the marketplace. Without a doubt, this is an area of exceptional promise, but it is not without fragility. Innovation and job creation can be easily stifled by regulations in this field as any other, if not more so. So it's in that vein that I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Are there any policies that you'd like cons Congress to consider? Are there any policies currently in place or under consideration that are stumbling blocks to further growth and innovation? How can we as policymakers m maintain an environment that fosters the innovation, creative, creativity, growth, and economic success that this sector currently enjoys? So I look forward to your testimony, and I yield the balance of my time to Marsha Blackburn. I thank the chairman for that. And Madam Chairman, I thank you for the hearing today. I think this is absolutely so timely and is an area where there is agreement. And I uh, am pleased that we're putting some focus on this. I, I think that from what you've heard today, you, you all know and we know that the growth of the apps economy, if you will, is truly dependent on free enterprise, uh, the private sector. It is looking for that individual initiative for how you solve a problem, whether it's the Where Waxman app or the What's New for Christmas app uh, that he may want to pull down and see what he can find for Christmas. The thing is, this entire economy was not born at the altar of big government. It was borne out by individuals that have a great idea and are looking for a way to pull that through um, to the marketplace. Now, what we do have to realize is that in order to have a productive apps economy, we've got to have spectrum and be able to launch these applications, whether they are for consumer shopping or for consumer health or safety, any number of things. This entire marketplace is young, it is revolutionary, it is disruptive to traditional business processes, and I think it is very exciting. So thank you all for being with us, Madam Chairman. Thank you for turning our attention to the issue. Yell back. I think the gentlelady and the chair now turns our attention to um, the panel. We have one panel of witnesses that are joining us for today's hearing. Included on the panel are Peter Farago, Vice President of Marketing at Flurry, Inc., Stephanie Hay, co-founder of Fast Customer and resident mentor, 500 Startups, Ray Ramsey, President and CEO of TechNet, and Morgan Reed, Executive Director, Association for Competitive Technology. Each of our witnesses have prepared an opening statement that will be placed into the record. Each of them will have five minutes to summarize their statement in their remarks. So good morning and thank you all very much for coming and for being here. Uh, to help you keep track of time, if you're not familiar with it already, there should be a timing clock on the table. Uh, when the light turns yellow, you'll have one minute to, to come to a conclusion. 
or behind us. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, so all you have to do is make sure that you uh, push the microphone on your push the on button on your microphone before you start. Make sure that the audience at home can hear you as well. So with that, Mr. Fargo, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you and good morning. Chair, Chairwoman Bona Mack, Ranking Member Butterfield, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning. My name is Peter Farrago, and I'm the head of marketing for Flurry, a high-tech startup based in Silicon Valley, specifically San Francisco. In 2007, when I joined the company, I was its eighth employee. We now have over 100 employees in multiple offices. Flurry helps mobile developers build, measure, advertise, and monetize their applications in the new app economy. One way to think of us is that we don't make the apps that everyone uses, we help make the apps that everyone uses better. Flurry has over 75,000 customers, most of which are entrepreneurs and startups. Because of that broad customer base and the over 200,000 apps using our services, Flurry has unique insight into the state of the current app economy as well as where it's headed. While my written report provides numerous trends and insights about the app economy, I'd like to highlight three of them. First, we're moving faster than any industry ever before. Second, there are real opportunities for job growth. And third, the United States has significant opportunities to increase exports. The new app economy represents the greatest, fastest adoption of any new consumer technology in the history of mankind. Smart devices are being adopted 10 times faster than the PC revolution of the 80s, two times faster than the internet boom of the 90s, and three times faster than the most recent social network phenomenon. This rate of adoption outpaces that of all other notable technologies any of us can think of, including electricity, radio, television, VCRs, microwaves, cell phones, dishwashers, and even stoves. And Fleury estimates that the world is only about a quarter of the way into the adoption cycle of this new consumer technology. Our study found that 60% of app startups have the majority of their employees in the U.S., and a recent Kaufman study concluded that the main driver of all new jobs comes from startups in their first year. There is unprecedented opportunity for America to capitalize on exploding international markets. The U.S. has 315 million active wireless devices, of which 170 million are smart devices. However, in the last year, while the U.S. has added 30 million smart devices, China has added 100 million. From our study, 70% of all companies surveyed already generate some revenue outside the U.S., and 94% strongly agree that the app economy will be increasingly international. So how do we turn these trends into opportunities? To capitalize on these trends, Flurry believes the ecosystem needs robust infrastructure, access to an educated technology workforce, and maintained low barriers to entry. Of these, I'd like to highlight access to talent. At Flurry, we literally cannot find the talent we need fast enough to fill all the open positions we have. We, while we have 100 employees now, we have 50 open positions. Additionally, our survey shows that our customers share our pain. Only 24% of respondents believe that their company can recruit enough skilled software developers. 84% of respondents strongly agree that their company's success is dependent on software development talent. Unless we solve this problem, America will not be positioned to fully capitalize on this unique moment in time. We in the tech industry, as well as policymakers, need to work hard to find creative solutions to fully realize the potential we have before us. This should include partnering to ensure better university education, better professional retraining, continuing education, and easing the ability to bring and keep international talent in the U.S. At Flurry, we look forward to continuing to play our role in making applications even better, help our customers grow their businesses, and provide the consumer with the best possible experience. I thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Hay, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Good morning. My name is Stephanie Hay, and I've been an enthusiastic leader in the tech community since moving to Alexandria from Ohio nearly 10 years ago. In 2003, while working in communications at George Mason University, I began building websites and creating templates to simplify how 30 departments managed their content online. Imagine being able to publish content on the internet instantaneously from anywhere. 
the speed and flexibility had me hooked. I left Mason for World Championship Sports Network, where I got my first taste of startup life, which included 2 a.m. working sessions from my couch, coordinating with remote teams in Manhattan and Los Angeles, changing priorities fast. In 2010, after several years in project management at agencies, I started my own consultancy. I also became more involved locally, taking board positions with the Art Directors Club, speaking at DC Tech and Refresh DC, and co-organizing the DC Lean Startup Circle, which today includes 1,200 entrepreneurs. In short, tech is my livelihood, and I've created jobs because of it too. For example, in 2010 alone, my first year in business, I hired five people as subcontractors. I co-launched Workspace Design Magazine. This monthly online publication is about the evolution of work, and it now employs three people. I also founded Nova Cowork, a group of nearly 150 entrepreneurs who meet each Wednesday in, at Iota Cafe in Clarendon, where comp companies have been launched, jobs created, and partnerships formed. You're welcome to attend. In fact, the startup I co-founded in 2011, Fast Customer, came from one of those meetups. Paul Singh, Aaron Dragashin, and I built a mobile app that, with a single tap, connects you directly with a human and customer service at more than 3,000 companies. We're using mobile technology to change customer service calls for the better, and we've hired eight people to help us. When we decided to raise money, 500 startups, an accelerator and fund in Silicon Valley, led our seed round. I'm now a resident mentor there as well, coaching startups on everything from positioning to pitching. I mentioned 500 startups because it's deploying smaller sums of cash faster, and it's actively working to involve more women, two characteristics that are atypical within the traditional venture capital world. Plus, nearly a third of its portfolio includes women-led startups, three of the six partners at 500 are women, and they launched a campaign in July to bring more women into the angel investing community through coaching and educational programs. That organizations like 500 Startups are committed to taking on this challenge of supporting female founders with useful apps and that I can be a part of influencing that future is invigorating. Plus, with more women like Facebook's Sheryl Sandberg and Yahoo's new CEO Marissa Mayer leading the way, I further my own resolve my own resolve to catapult other smart women into decision-making positions with, within tech. Of course, I'm here today because I believe you can help, too. Earlier this year, I spoke with Jennifer Boss, a tech-savvy woman whose job with the D.C. Mayor's office is to identify new innovations fit for public sector applications. Fast Customer is a D.C.-founded company that already connects callers to agencies such as the IRS, which generates thousands of calls annually. Surely we could not only help agencies better connect with their people, but politicians with their constituents. Again, the possibilities are endless. However, we, like Instagram, which just sold for $1 billion, operate without a dedicated enterprise sales staff. So after a few promising conversations about how we could modify Fast Customer for real-world pilots in the public sector, we were then placed into the standard procurement process required of any vendor who wants to do business with the government. This was startling because they had approached us. Yet we, and they, were hampered by procurement rules that couldn't accommodate new products like ours. We couldn't demo, demo an out-of-the-box product with clear public sector features because it didn't exist. So we were forced to end discussions. The contrasting reality is that we already were in talks with telecom giants in the public sector, including Verizon, Comcast, and Telstra. These companies recognized that innovation and agile process in which we mobile startups work, which meant we could continue building, learning, and iterating at the speed of mobile, the speed of our world today. That we might expand internationally before we could meet rigid expectations in our own backyard is discouraging, but we believe there are massive opportunities to be realized if government removes barriers that hinder our tech companies and brilliant people from engaging with the public sector. What can we do together to find com compromise and more quickly bring tech innovations into our government? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hay. Uh, Mr. Ramsey, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Chairwoman and uh, the committee, I, I applaud you for having this, uh, this session, and it's very important. My name is Ray Ramsey. I'm the CEO of TechNet. Appreciate you uh, all mentioning the study that we put out uh, last year. Uh, that study um, has sparked a lot of conversation um, looking at the amount of jobs. I mean, the headline from that study is that almost 500,000 jobs have been created since uh, uh, 2007. And so what I want to do is, since my uh, testimony has already been submitted, I just want to talk to you about a few things um, that I think are really important and highlight um, um, those issues. 
we've gotten to this place, which is a pretty good place for the country um, to have this number of jobs and growing. We've gotten here because it's been a wonderful confluence of several things happening. One, you have the technology itself, much of which has been proudly invented in the United States. You also have this consumer demand for ease of transaction, um, where consumers in so many different ways are saying, make this easy for me and meet me where I am, this sort of mobile sensitivity. We now have 50% of all the phones are smartphones. That's up from 17% just a few years ago, so explosive growth. And so with this confluence and with entrepreneurs uh, like Ms. Hay and others that are out there inventing and looking for economic a activity, we've got several great benefits, jobs at the top of the list, economic activity. Um, but when you look at all of the advantages, you step back and you say there are two things from a policy perspective we need to focus on. One is how do we continue to maximize what's happening? How do we continue to take advantage of this? Are there things that policymakers can do? And then with your other set of eyes, take a look at are there any threats to this? And you say to yourself, what do we need to do to mitigate potential threats? And I just want to comment on, on a few things. One is, and I think the way to look at this from my perspective is, um, from a policy perspective, there are two things. One would be focus on the necessary infrastructure to keep this going. And then the second issue, I would say, is an issue of access. So I just reduce it to that. If I'm in the elevator with you, I would say it's infrastructure and it's access. Under infrastructure, and you've heard part of it, um, and, it and it all revolves around capital. You have human capital, which you heard earlier, which is the workforce issue. Um, one of the things that will impede the growth, even in the apps economy, because people tend to think of the apps economy as only the little guys, the small companies. Well, they have a need for workforce but so do large companies as well. So we're in a uh, human capital crunch being able to get the kind of workforce that we need, and that's a string of policies all the way from our school systems all the way through to college, how many engineers, how many systems programmers, and even some of our targeted training programs. So I think it creates an opportunity to take a look at that, at that human capital ecosystem and say, how is it working for this? How are we utilizing community colleges? Are there training programs that could be targeted? Look at existing agencies and ask ourselves whether it's the SBA and others, have they caught up with the, with the apps economy? Are there things? And then ask the fundamental question, if there's an entrepreneur out there and she's sitting at home and she's thinking, I can get into this too, and that's one of the beauties of this, where could she go in, in our communities or in our society to get in the game? And that gets to the access issue. There are segments of the population that could join this job explosion, create additional income for their homes and for their families if they knew about what existed or if we had programs that were targeted to get to them. We still need to see more women um, participating in this workforce and in these opportunities. So that's just a question of outreach. Back to the issue of infrastructure. Um, without getting into all the details, um, Congressman Blackburn started off by saying spectrum, that's crucial, broadband, crucial. We still have too many rural areas of the country where people aren't um, able to take advantage because they don't have the broadband connections, the issue of broadband adoption. So there are some infrastructure issues that from a policy perspective we need to make sure are in place along with workforce issues. There are some other issues like uh, privacy and, and other sorts of things, just making sure that when we look at any of these policies, that we look at them through the prism of will this continue this movement toward job creation and economic activity, or will there be unintended consequences? The last thing I'll say is what's exciting about this app economy is that it is not only having great benefits in the commercial sector, it is having terrific benefits from a social innovation perspective, where it is helping with health care, issues like diabetes and people's drug regimens and other things like that. So it's a double win for society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ramsey. And Ms. Reed, welcome back to the subcommittee. It's nice to have you back. So you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> and I have to say before I even get to my time, which is uh, don't steal all our people for you big companies. Us, us small folks still need employees. We, we, we have to be able to compete. Uh, Chairman Bono Mack, uh, Ranking Member Butterfield, uh, distinguished members of the committee, my name is Morgan Reed, and I am the Executive Director of the Association for Competitive Technology, a trade association representing over 5,000 app makers from around the world. 
Our members are on the forefront of the most exciting tech sector to emerge in a generation. Um, you may have already heard these numbers, but they bear repeating. We are a $20 billion industry today that didn't exist four years ago. And analysts expect us to hit $100 billion by 2015. Now, we all know about the rise of smartphones, and I've already seen several of you checking your email, and we know about reading maps and looking at sharing photos and managing everyday activities through wireless devices. But what we are seeing now is an apps economy that is moving beyond games and consumer tools to become a critical part of enterprise, health, and financial services. In order to provide the committee with new insights, we conducted a study we called Apps Across America in preparation for the hearing. And I thank several of you for uh, quoting us on some of the numbers that we've gotten out of here. But to focus on a couple, we all know that small, engines are the small businesses are the engine of job creation, occupying over 70% of the top selling apps. And we found this is even more pronounced in highly innovative activities where large revenue sources are available. This is a phenomenon happening outside of Silicon Valley. And, and with, with uh, all due respect to California, I love the fact that we've got developers in Louisiana, in Mississippi, in Michigan. And I like the fact that we're seeing the spread move around. Um, in your briefing folder, you'll find a set of baseball cards that we created to underscore this point. There's one for every district represented. And I, I couldn't find any of that horrible gum we all had as kids, but uh, I tried. Um, you know, Marsha Blackburn was here, and, and I, I want to focus on the way that, that these folks are looking at it. You know, from her district, we have a true MVP. They've had over 30 million downloads on apps that they've created. Uh, this company in her district, Mercury Intermedia, huge success. This is an MVP, a perennial all-star. All um, <clears throat> in New Hampshire, we have PolicePad. Zico is building an enterprise app that puts iPads in police cars and replaces all of those laptops that you see in cars. Better battery life, more efficient, all sorts of new sensors, great tool. These guys, definitely an all-star. But in Bono Max District, we've got a, ro a rookie card. And uh, with Apps 111, this is a company that I'm looking forward to becoming more successful. And just like any rookie card, I don't just want the card to become successful. I want the business to become successful. I'd love for members to be able to trade that car. I remember when they started. Now. There are 100,000 people, or there are 50,000 people. So when you look at this deck of cards in front of you, this is your MVPs. This is your starting lineup of your small business community today. <clears throat> now, we all know about Apple's innovation and the ubiquity of Android. But you know, it's worth mentioning that it's not just those two. BlackBerry is the go-to platform for security-focused customers um, and, and earns more, frankly, for our developers per app than any other platform. And of course, just last week, uh, Microsoft and Nokia kind of upped the game unveiling the Lumia 920, which featured wireless charging, which I am so happy for, uh, and of course uh, had near-field communications so that you can actually purchase goods and services directly from your phone without having to pull out your credit card at all. And of course, today, after this hearing, we'll see what Apple does to up the game again. We've got, uh, they've got Passbook on there that allows mobile payments to pay for coffee at Starbucks, but what I love is it features a uh, uh, an app that allows you to check in at the airport directly built into a secure feature on the phone. So what's next? Mobile healthcare apps are gonna change the way doctors interact with patients. Companies like Airstrip have built an app that allows doctors to monitor fetal heart rates in women in labor directly on their iPad. Enterprise will use phones and tablets at every level. Aegis Software has built an app that allows them to monitor entire factory floor directly from the iPad. And I brought this, this is July's Fortune magazine cover, and it's declared the death of cash. Well, you'd say, how is that possible? But PayPal, Intuit, and Square have turned a mobile phone or an iPad into a point of sale and a cash register. You see those little things on the top and swipe your card and away you go. That's your cash register. You know, in the movie Princess Bride, the protagonist famously responded to the word inconceivable with the retort, <clears throat> you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. But for the future of the app's economy, inconceivable is the most appropriate word. Industry and government cannot yet conceive of the ways that apps will become part of our lives. From basic consumer uses to health, travel, education, and even talking to one another, our app economy, built by small businesses seeing and meeting a specific need, has endless and inconceivable possibilities. We hope to keep creating never-before-conceived-of products, and we hope the government can be a partner where needed, take advantage of products where they help serve the public, and take a light-touch approach everywhere else. Thank you for your interest, and I look forward to your questions.
Um, thank you very much to the panel, and the <clears throat> chair will now recognize herself for five minutes for a question, and uh, also point out to anybody standing that there are plenty of seats available. Uh, if they say reserved, um, they were reserved for you, so welcome. Um, I just wanted to start by something kind of shameless, and that is showing everybody this amazing photograph of my grandson, little Sonny. And the only reason I'm doing this is I was babysitting him um, a few nights ago, and he decided to have a crying fit, so I did anything any good grandmother would do is I went right to the app store and downloaded Baby Soother, a Baby Soother. It, it didn't really work, but, <laughs> but my point was that I, we're becoming habituated. You have a problem, you go to the app store, and you find a solution to any problem you might have. Uh, now, not unique to babysitting is not, you know, guys should babysit their grandbabies too, but um, I'm going to start with you, Ms. Hay. What is the key to getting more women involved uh, in this area of tech? I think it's outreach. I think most women I've met have um, almost always had, almost always had another woman or a man mentor them, myself included, bringing them into the tech scene. Um, there are a lot of women in tech groups in DC I know of. It's a matter of the, that sort of grassroots effort on the ground, and at the same time, I think some programs that help to uh, educate women on the opportunities that exist out there for them in tech. There's a general, I think, um, fear that women have that is almost, uh, it's almost a badge of honor that, that men wear in Silicon Valley, that they're going to be an entrepreneur, and if they fail, that's okay. And women generally tend to be more conservative. They take a more strategic approach to ensuring that, um, they're, that they are building a, a business that's going to last and it's going to be uh, fruitful. So I think, you know, balancing, balancing the programs that are available to them so that they can move a little more quickly and comfortably into the tech space, I think, would be, would, would, would be a great step in the right direction. All right, thank you. Um, others have testified that apps jobs do not, do not require being located in specific geographic locations and, in fact, are being uh, created all across the U.S. This is again to you, Ms. Hay. Do you see any future risk to the ability of app developers not located in the major cities producing apps because they're not part of a technology cluster? I don't know. In fact, Fast Customer, we have an entirely distributed team. So I have a developer in Reston, and then we have staff in Florida, Arizona, Hawaii, and one right now walking around Cambodia somewhere. So, <laughs> so, so for us to, to be successful, I think, in, in the mobile economy because of its speed requires a smart team, requires resources, doesn't require a specific geographic location. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, we don't get together as we do. In fact, every quarter, some, some amount of time to get together because, uh, you know, getting together in person, great ideas can happen in a way that's more organic than what you can accomplish online. But that, that isn't to say, but that, that's also not a prerequisite to success. Thank you. Um, Mr. Farago, a number of observers have compared the growth of the app field to the tech bubble of the 90s. Would you agree with that? And do, you, do we face a danger of a burst here? And if so, are there any steps uh, the industry or policymakers should take to avoid that? Yeah, we, we've talked about this a bit. We, we don't feel there's a direct comparison to, to the internet era and uh, that we don't face a bubble uh, for several reasons. I'd say first, um, uh, if you think about the amount of broadband connected consumers at that time, there were about, I believe, 30 million. Now there's over 1 billion. So we have a totally different sized market to begin with. Uh, secondly, um, you know, in that era, the real way to make money was to get a bunch of eye collect a bunch of eyeballs and then hope that advertising revenue would, would uh, follow. In this era, uh, advertising really hasn't kicked in as a revenue model. And we're already seeing, you know, by our estimation, app developers last year made about $5 billion worldwide directly to them, 80% um, of which was made from what we call premium sales, selling a, an app, you pay $2 before you get it, or in-app purchase or microtransactions, you buy add-on content afterward. This year, we're, we're forecasting at, uh, developers directly will make about $10 billion, about double that, again, around 80% plus or minus. Advertising will take off and add a layer. Uh, and so, so that will uh, certainly help. Also, if we think about, if we compare the economic climates, um, you know, really, arguably, uh, the app economy was built 
uh, you know, flowers have bloomed on top of the rubble of the largest worldwide financial collapse any of us can remember. And uh, whereas, you know, it was pretty, pretty much the go-go time in the 90s where there was a lot of venture capital flowing. So you have almost what has been proven to be uh, a really recession-proof uh, business uh, model to begin with, or economy, really. Um, and, and, and finally, customers are able to pay, not just willing to pay. They've demonstrated they can. Every one of these devices has a credit card or a gift card associated with it on average. Whereas, you know, back, back in the Internet days, you know, products, you know, all the services people assumed would be free, and there wasn't that kind of payment-enabled uh, uh, addressable market. Thank you. And my time has expired, so the chair now recognizes Mr. Harper for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you to each of uh, uh, you folks to taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. And Mr. Reed, thank you for pointing out the cards, particularly Mississippi State University Athletics. Uh, I don't think you had time in your testimony to say anything about State beating Auburn 28 to 10 Saturday, but perhaps we can cover that. Perhaps we can uh, find some statistics on the game uh, on that uh, app. Uh, and I uh, also want to say, Ms. Hay, thank you for uh, uh, the work you're doing. I have a 20-year-old daughter. Uh, I've made it a point to make uh, sure that she has opportunities to meet with successful women. Uh, it helps her in, in that regard, and, uh, and so uh, thank you for that effort. I think that uh, you may be getting a call from, uh, from her in the, sometime you. in the future when she's visiting. Thank you. Uh, I do want to uh, talk to you, if I can, for just a second, Mr. Farrago, if I may. Uh, you uh, said in your testimony, you mentioned the recent survey that was done by Flurry, which found that 71 percent of the companies polled agreed with the statement that they needed more employees with technical training. And I wanted to bring uh, to your attention the work that uh, Mississippi State University has been doing in the app uh, field. Over the past several years, Dr. Rodney Pearson, who is a professor at Mississippi State uh, in the Department of uh, Management and Information Systems, I know his work diligently to develop courses in programming as well as business and entrepreneurial classes uh, to prepare students for a job in the app sector or at least spur an interest in the app field. Uh, Dr. Pearson and Mississippi State have been seen by many as a business and app incubator. Uh, so uh, a few questions I have. One, is Mississippi State a special case or do you see many other universities uh, offering similar courses at this time? Well, I, you know, I don't have I don't have specific anecdotes about other universities, uh, but those kinds of innovative programs are exactly what we need. I think it's a supply and demand issue. I think that, uh, you know, mostly when you grow up in the U.S., you think about being a doctor or a lawyer, or, um, you know, maybe go to business. Um, but you know, technology field, growing the awareness of of technology, encouraging those to get involved, uh, K through 12, making sure that the foundation of fundamentals are there enables. I think, you know, great programs like the one Dr. Pearson is leading at Mississippi State to be possible. By the time that uh, student comes to that university, uh, they can, uh, they can and, and will be able to take advantage of, you know, what is a great uh, lucrative job field. How do you see uh, this playing into the future growth of the app sector, uh, this being offered in this university and perhaps others? Where do you see that taking the future, meeting those needs that you see in the app sector? Yeah, I mean, if I understand your, your question correctly, I, I, you know, I, I see it uh, in, inside the United States as, uh, as um, enabling a concept we call state shoring. Um, you know, it was mentioned that California and New York are the two main hubs for technology innovation and clustering of, uh, of technology workforce talent. Um, at the same time, I believe the median uh, house costs about half a million dollars in each of those markets. Um, you know, much like you have a match program for uh, medical uh, folks coming out of medical universities to go to all kinds of places around the U.S. to, to offer the same level of care. Uh, I think that uh, the concept of state shoring can really help, and as universities look to become more competitive in the education market, a lot of universities like Mississippi State can and should invest in the kinds of programs to attract that talent, and that will keep more talent uh, in, in the local economy and, and allow that entrepreneurship to basically spread across the United States. Okay, how do we encourage other universities to be involved in this field and to, to move in that direction? Um, you know, I think there's, there's uh, probably a couple ways. I mean, I think, I think education of educators is, is a good start. I mean, uh, I think a lot, I think a hearing such as this one, uh, sharing those statistics, uh, the educational uh, field, from my experience, is pretty connected as a, as a cohort, as a group. Um, I think that government could definitely help with, um, 
uh, maybe partnering with the private sector, for example, and uh, there could be matching programs to create more endowments and, and um, you know, uh, education, you know, basically paying for a student's education. Uh, you could creatively, after the fact, uh, help, uh, you know, if, if you have a company that's investing in, a, in an area local to a university and they have a partnership with that uh, university, for example, you know, there could be some sort of increased modest taxation of that developer's salary to pay back, you know, what was a, what was a gift, basically, for the cost of education and so on. Um, there, there's a number of ways, I think, those who have skin in the game, private sector and, and university can get together and, 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 and figure those things out. I want to thank each of you for being here. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And the Chair recognizes Dr. Cassidy for five minutes. Yeah, I enjoyed it. I had a really nice conversation yesterday with a couple of app developers from my own um, state. And uh, just a couple of things that I would like your perspective on, not that there will necessarily be an answer, but clearly we're coming to you for your perspective, which is key. Um, one of the things we've had several hearings on is privacy. So they kind of alerted me to the fact that there's really kind of an issue. Who owns the data? If I put a picture up, do, do I own the picture? Or does the app developer? Or does the server? Who owns the data? So any thoughts on the privacy? Because again, when I get a 50-page document and I click I agree at the very bottom, I've not read those 50 pages. I've just clicked I agree. And I almost think that might be a strategy by the attorneys to get me to agree. They just overwhelm it. Once I actually read it, and it was so redundant, some of the pages were literally cut and pasted multiple times. I remember thinking, this was just a strategy to overwhelm me. And it frankly works all the time. So that said, what are your thoughts as to who should own that data? How personalized should we allow it to be? Because that is something that we have pursued in this committee, that, that, that discussion. Well, I think it's, it's kind of two questions in one. You have a question of who owns what, um, and that's an important question. Um, we've always, in this country, had a kind of a, a pretty straightforward attitude towards uh, information that I willingly provide. Uh, if you think of it this way, um, if you had a 13-year-old daughter and she walks into Forever 21, or I guess I should say 16-year-old daughter walking into Forever 21, and they get her information or email address to send her uh, information, it, it had nothing to do with online, it didn't have anything to do with a, a mobile app, but Forever 21 now has information. They have the store that she bought at, what she purchased, her email address, and Forever 21 considers that part of their information. And, and again, she didn't read through a 50-page click memo or anything, she just signed up right there in the store. So we've had a pretty good tradition in this country of allowing folks to enter into those kinds of agreements freely because they benefit from it. Um, so you have that question of pri you know, who owns the data and, and how do they collect it. But then I think the other side is what we're focusing on is how do we do a good job of being transparent, which you pointed out wasn't done well in the example you cited. A 50-page document is not transparent. Um, so what we're working with developers on and um, in fact, this Friday, I'll be speaking to an audience of uh, about 500 developers at Modev Tablet here on the East Coast, and I'll be talking about ways to increase transparency to build better trust. So on the trust aspect, we need to do a better job. We are working on it. And in fact, we're participating with the White House as part of the NTIA multi-stakeholder process to find best practices and common ground between uh, the entire stakeholder community to find ways to take a small device and present a 50-page chunk of information in a way that's absorbable, understandable, and usable by consumers. And I think, I think once we get there, I think we'll, uh, we'll be able to help your, fo you know, your, your person who com commented about 50 pages have a better sense of what's happening and be more comfortable with it. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, to comment on that. Obviously, it's a, it's a complex issue. And, you know, um, as my colleague here, Mr. Reed, said, you know, you've got the transparency issue and you've got the consent issue. And, and they're, they're interwoven. What's important while we're trying to sort through how to get to a common understanding of consent and transparency is to keep a few things in mind that we need to do along the way. One is we need to make sure that everybody understands what the business models are um, and how these business models um, rely on certain data. Um, it, it, they're not mutually exclusive, but we need to understand that because there are unintended consequences. So all of this growth that we're describing, whether it's small businesses or larger businesses, are all part of this ecosystem of mobility. And that's really what the issue is. I mean, we're having this conversation about, about apps, but it's really all about the mobile revolution, and apps are, are a part of the mobile revolution. The other issue would be um, we've got to do more 
to have citizens understand, consumers understand, not only what their rights are, but what their responsibilities are at, and that they're leaving behind a digital footprint all the way from. So you're suggesting that indeed the developer or the server does own the data. If there's I, a digital footprint, you're suggesting that footprint is no longer mine. It's, it's data that exists, and the, and the question is where that data will reside. So I'm not using the word ownership. It's about where the data resides. So, if data I, resides. If, so that picture that she just showed us, could that be used by the person where she stores it as a Gerber baby commercial without her permission? Did, did you follow what I'm saying? No, you so, so is that picture of her grandchild... By the way, she's the best-looking grandmother I've ever seen, but that's it. Yeah. Um, that picture of her grandchild, could that in turn, does she, does, does she, does her, does, does her, do her daughter and son-in-law, whatever, or does the person on whom it's stored get to sell it to Gerber as the next image on the box? I, I, I can't comment on whether or not they're going to sell her. She owns, the congresswoman owns her picture. The question is where that resides and it resides in multiple places. So it's not a question of who owns it. It's more about what the data is being used for and understanding for the congresswoman in this example, what does she know, which means, you know, in favor of her knowing what the basis of the bargain is, and that's the transparency that I'm talking about, what her rights and responsibilities are. That's, that's what I'm trying to sort out. It's not about that another company would own the picture. I'm still not sure that we know that the company could not use that picture, but I'm way out of time, and I had another question, but I'll yield back. We'll, we'll do a second round after we go through everybody the first time, and thank you very much for the questions, and the chair recognizes Mr. Kinzinger for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and, and I thank you all for coming out. I think this is a very important uh, uh, issue we're discussing. You know, one of the concerns is, as we've seen uh, apps develop, we obviously see, and many of you have testified, that it's really going to be generating GDP growth. It's kind of the next generation of where we're seeing a lot of jobs come in. I have a lot of cool apps on my phone that I use for a lot of various things. And, you know, if you ever find yourself, like, with the need for any kind of data or any kind of uh, organizational tool, you will find it on your app phone somewhere. Somebody's created it. So I think it's, a, it's an outstanding, obviously, driver of the future. Uh, first question, though, to, to Ms. Hay, um, what's the chief barrier as you look at this, uh, as you look at the environment out there, what would you say is the chief barrier uh, for somebody who wants to develop an app to uh, enter or to expand their business, and, and what do you hear from some of these entrepreneurs as far as where's their frustrations, where's their concerns, what's their wish list for the future of this? Well, I think it depends on the scope of the kind of project they want to work on. So in talking to some app developers who are prototyping a small idea to really solve a very niche problem, there are very relatively few barriers. Being able to ask Google the right questions to get the answers is really the barrier. <laughs> so, um, but I think for the larger companies that are trying to, to solve more um, widespread educational, healthcare types of problems where there are embedded um, relationships with big guys like Google, Microsoft, I think the barrier to entry is having the skill set, even in the case that I was talking about with Fast Customer, having the skill set to be able to have the, build the relationships, be able to survive long enough, the long enough uh, financial runway to be able to develop those relationships over time and really be able to influence change. So I think that that, that barrier is, is a much more uh, social, um, even economic one than, than technical for sure. I guess I'll ask the rest of you maybe the same question to see if you are all in agreement or if any of you have an idea in mind of saying, hey, here's how we make it easier without, you know, I guess the Wild West of it. But how, uh, Mr. Ramsey, do you have any input on that question about any barriers that exist? Yeah, um, uh, Mr. Congressman, I, I think, you know, as was mentioned earlier, you think of the barriers sort of fall into their demographics, um, geographic demographics, demographics based on gender, ge demographics based on race. And so what we have to do from a policy perspective is make information more available so that there are women, minorities, and others who but for not knowing what's available to them could be in business. And so one of the things is just making information available. If there are programs like the congressman from Louisiana, uh, from the congressman from Mississippi was saying at the college, we need to, from an access perspective, make sure, sure that women would know about that program. And so there's what I find, and I've done work in inner cities and other places where people just don't know 
about what's out there. And then I think the second thing is, is just making sure the basic infrastructure is in place. So when we look at the broadband maps, you can't do this if you don't have the right access. You can't do this if spectrum is an issue you know, in your, in your area. So from a broad policy perspective, you've got big <coughs> infrastructure issues to make sure are in place. And then from an access outreach, a big part of that is comfort and information, having so, people feel comfortable. So if you have your, your, I guess, if you had your wish list, it would be marrying the ability to get to the Internet with the, uh, the skill set to do what's important to present this app, of course, with the folks that may have the idea. So somebody that may not have access to Spectrum uh, may have a great idea, and they have no idea how to get that, ha that out of their head into action. That's exactly right. And this just mirrors what happens in the offline world when someone is just sort of living their life, they view an opportunity and they go, oh, well, there's a need here. I'm going to open up a laundromat. Oh, there's a need here. I'm going to open up. And how do up. I get there? And so it's how do you get there? And a lot of people are still learning that there's not the barrier to entry that there might have otherwise been. And so this access to information is really important. And I just have 40 seconds left. I want to ask both Mr. Reed and Mr. Farrago if you guys have input on that as well. Well, I want to I want to follow up um, with what Ray said, and I think there are some characteristics. I want to look a little further into the future. Spectrum is a huge part of it. If I, if I can't get my app into an enterprise, and I want to remind you that I think the big areas, we're moving away from 99 cent apps into where we're talking about critical, critical applications for business, for health, for financial services. So the problem is if I don't have the infrastructure, I can't get in there. Second thing is, if I'm new in mobile health, I need to make sure that the FDA moves quickly and that they do a, a fast approval process. And finally, as I look down the, down the roadmap, I need to make sure that when I get my app into the marketplace that it doesn't get stolen. So we have all of those issues, and those are Thanks. places where the government can play a role. Mr. Fair, did you have anything to add? Just a handful of seconds. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, the issues we see are, are probably more business-oriented. Uh, smaller companies don't have the resources. That's why I think there's a lot of third-party service providers like ours who can basically – uh, put a small company on equal footing with a much larger company that has resources. Um, so, so many of the services we have will basically augment the developer's activity. They can focus on creating great content. Uh, but there's a significant problem on the larger uh, side of the spectrum with big companies where they don't think mobile first. Uh, they're not as nimble and fast as companies. They're kind of suffering from what we call the innovator's dilemma. Uh, and they don't, they don't, you know, sort of appreciate all the possibilities. So companies on average that do better in the mobile uh, ecosystem are doing a better, smarter job of, of leveraging what's on the phone. Open table, restaurant reservation, uses location to basically Thanks. conveniently give you a reservation, for example, in the area you are now. And okay. it's companies who think like that who are doing better. Well, thank you, and I'm over my time, and I appreciate it, and you'll bet. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Guthrie for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you for having us, being here today. I was, I was at another meeting on Spectrum, so I'm sorry I missed some of the testimony, but something important to what you guys are talking about today as well. And, and I know in the written testimony, Mr. Ramsey, you, and, and I open this to everybody, you used the term freedom to innovate. And so I guess my question would be um, what restrictions are you – we need to maintain the freedom to innovate or you're going to have less innovation is what you're saying. And what does that actually mean? What restrictions are you concerned about, particularly – and I think you just said one of the FDA process and medical apps, what things could government do intentionally or unintentionally – and I can start with Mr. Ramsey or any of you, to uh, restrict your ability to innovate in the app world. Again, I think it's, it's more of making sure barriers are not in place. And so as both Mr. Such Re as, and, such as. So if there is no uh, broadband available, if there's not adoption in your community, if you run into spectrum where you can't get on, um, these types of barriers, and then over time, if you can't acquire a workforce. And so it's more about making sure barriers are in place than it is about let's push something, you know, toward you. In the area of push would be the making sure human capital is available, making sure there are training programs, making sure people know what's available at the community college, at the university, you know, and those sorts of things. But a lot of this is making sure we remove barriers. That's a good question, and I was going to ask Mr. Farrago something on that, along that line since we already got there. What, how are most people in that world, are they engineer graduates from Stanford? Or are they in their Silicon Valley? Or is it just, are they taught on site? Where do you find talent for it? Because this is something that, you know, most states want to have jobs that people can do that make a good living. And this, where do you find talent? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, I think from, from anywhere. Uh, the bar is pretty high at our company. Um, you know, the core, you know, it's not, it's, 
in, in the startup world, it's also about risk tolerance. I mean, there's a certain kind of person, uh, I, I carry my school debt. <laughs> uh, you know, I didn't go to certain big companies because I really wanted to be an entrepreneur, and so I'm, I'm eating my debt still. So um, uh, it's, you know, there, there are enough people who are uh, passionate in the startup space, uh, but probably the population is more on the business side. The technical side is where we see, where we struggle uh, to, to fill enough of the open positions we need. Uh, they traditionally come from the best universities in the world. Um, out of India, you have IIT, in the United States, MIT, Caltech, Cal, Carnegie Mellon. I'm sure I'm leaving out some fantastic universities, Stanford. Uh, we have a lot of graduates from a lot of those places. Um, and, and, and on average, I'd say we're getting ours from uh, probably the cream of the crop of universities of the world is probably the highest, and, and a lot of people with advanced degrees. That's, that's primarily who we end up hiring on average. Um, that's, that's a lot of where they're coming from. So, so there's not, a, in your space, the technical degree. You're, look, you're looking for degreed engineers I, I and from the say, best schools in the, in the world. That's true. But I should also say, you know, Fleury is a little bit of a unique business. We're a business-to-business -business company, and we build a lot of very highly scalable te technical infrastructure, which uh, requires uh, back-end. You know, people have a lot of back, what we call back-end experience, infrastructure mm -hmm. experience. And it's very different than someone conceiving of a very useful, entertaining kind of consumer experience who can leverage all that infrastructure. So I'd say, you know, we're atypical in that we, uh, we are building a lot more scalable systems that we have to imagine uh, tens of thousands of other companies leveraging seamlessly that we provide to them. So we have a little bit of a different um, nut to crack. I think that's how but yeah, I want to, and then. Thank you. I, I have two comments. Num number one, around your first question, I think one of the fears in a lot of app developers is that they're going to be sued by the big guys who have a lot more money, big legal counsel, ready to, when they are innovating, just pounce on them immediately and squash them. So I think that's a real concern. Are there examples concern. of that? Has that, has that happened? In the, has that happened? Oh, yes, people? absolutely. So it, on anything, somebody might be on, on their way up, and then someone they don't know exists comes along with a lot more money and says, hey, that's, you know, that's infringing on this thing that we did seven years ago, and therefore now you're, now you're dead. So that, that's, I think, an, an issue that will continue to, to get more attention and should get more attention. Um, and the second part is, I think, when it comes to finding people, the, the computer science major that may have 10 years ago been all the rage is, is a dime a dozen. It's not about finding people. It's about, because most of these people who are very talented technically want to be entrepreneurs because of the app economy. So they are not trying to go get hired. They are trying to hire people. Mm -hmm. So now you've got a, a scenario where folks like Living Social are really capitalizing on this here locally because they were having a hard time finding developers in the specialized uh, programming that they have. So they created a program, three to four month long program called Hungry Academy and brought people in, many of whom were women, who had no technical skills, had never actually built anything before and paid them to learn how to build on their program. And the early results of just a couple weeks ago that they finished was that these people could walk right into their jobs and work on the program in a way that people who were hired and had to be onboarded could not. If I could just was, so you talk about people coming in, most of them women. You said, are they coming some in with some degree? Or are they coming no. just like high school graduates? Apprenticeship style. Apprenticeship. But they're coming, but they're showing up with just a base skill. Correct. And then four months they are able breathe. to do what you want to do. That's great. Water. That's great. They, right. Yeah. That, that's wonderful. They don't have a technical skill otherwise. That's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Bass for Thank five you, minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Apps are intellectual property. Uh, they're patented or copyrighted? Yeah. Some. Depends. Uh, trademarks, the full panoply of uh, law applies. So there's some of their ideas are copyrighted. Uh, some of it's copyright, some of it's patent, some of it's trademark. So when Ms. Hay talks about getting slammed down, that's the basis of the problem, basically. You're copying well, somebody. I I think, I think it's actually worth noting that it's a, it's a double-edged sword. She's right. Sometimes the big companies come in and slam us down. But the other problem we have is when a big company bigfoots us, which is the reverse problem, which is we do something truly innovative, and then a large company essentially copies what the small guy has done, but he has the marketing power and the wherewithal to really just own that space. And so on one hand, we need to watch out for the guy who comes behind us, but we also need to make sure that we've got covered our ability to go to the big guy and say, hey, don't crowd us out. We want an opportunity to compete. Is there any role for us in dealing with that issue? Yeah, yeah I'll start and then I'll hand it over to Ray. But we definitely, we definitely have needs when it comes to improving the quality um, within the patent and trademark system. Patents can be useful, but the quality is, is from time to time questionable. And with pendency at two years, 
two years. Um, you know, that was halfway through the beginning of the app economy, and they're still working on patents. Real briefly. Oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, um, Mr. Mm -hmm. Carmen, I, I would just say, you know, the uh, I, I don't want to turn this into a discussion of, of sort of the patent, you right, know, because laws. Because it's not in the jurisdiction. Of the right. Case, right. <laughs> and, it's, and it's also very complex. And I, I just want to, again, urge that we continue to look at the apps economy as part of a broader ecosystem that builds on mobility, that includes the entrepreneurs, big, small, codependent um, uh, ecosystem where they exist on each other's platforms, each other's marketing ability, you know, et cetera. We've got about a dozen app stores. Those stores reside on with, with so-called large companies who then work with big carriers. We're all part of this ecosystem, and it's important to remember that. We, we at TechNet represent both small companies and entrepreneurs. We have many startups, and we also have large companies. And we focus on policies that will create an ecosystem where they will both thrive, and that's important to the U.S. economy. Is the app economy going to go like the economies of all industri industrial products, engines, autos, computers, and so forth, and become consolidated and commoditized? Yeah, I think what, again, I don't have the crystal ball, Congressman, but what's happening when we look at the apps economy right now is we're, se we're seg segregating off a number of different specific jobs and small businesses. But what's happening is, over time, there will be this ubiquity that all companies will basically be transacting in some mobile application way. So as this continues, it'll be seamless. So big companies that you think of will have apps. Little companies have apps. It's just the way to reach the consumer. This is being driven by consumers saying, meet me where I am and give me a service in a way that I want that service. So it creates opportunities for anyone in business. That's the, that's, the way this is, that's the way this is moving. Congressman Bass, it's worth noting that the largest app development shop on the East Coast is actually in your district. Zico is incredibly successful. Now, you haven't heard of it, but I promise you that apps that are used by members of Congress here and that are probably on whatever smart device you have were actually made by Zico. So on one level, they're going to be consolidation. But on the other level, as, uh, uh, as Peter talked about earlier, a low, the low barrier entry means that the apps that you might see branded with a big name mm -hmm. are actually written by a little guy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to remember as we do this consolidation, that low barrier means I can build it even, even, without, even while consolidation is happening. We're going to have a spectrum hearing tomorrow in another subcommittee. To what extent uh, is access to spectrum or insufficient spectrum a major factor in this industry? We're all here. Yeah. We're like nodding. together, uh, uh, Mr. Reed and I are both going big. It's a, it's a big issue, and it would be one of those things that would um, circumvent this growth uh, in, in this area if we don't solve that issue. I don't have any further questions, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Bass. The Chair is pleased to recognize Mr. Markey for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. Um, <clears throat> I just throw this in because, you know, apps um, very commonly – access our sensitive information, our location, our phone books, photos, web browsing, history. And apps often do this without prior notice and even when the app isn't actively being used. And this morning I introduced legislation, the Mobile Device Privacy Act, that requires app sellers to disclose if monitoring software is installed when a consumer downloads an app. The, Mr. Cassidy is uh, concerned about this, and you know this is a bipartisan concern. Um, and the bill also requires uh, consumers to affirmatively consent before the monitoring software begins collecting and uh, transmitting information. So they should know what's happening. Uh, and uh, otherwise, I mean, there, there really are s significant societal issues that that uh, have to be discussed, have to be debated um, on this committee. We have to understand it. Okay, that's something where you don't need to have a, you know, a degree in computer science. You're saying, what, what? Gathering all this information about, you know, a 13-year-old girl, you know, and to be used for what purpose? Um, and what notice was given? So all of this absolutely has to be discussed. That's, those are just the values, you know, that our grandparents, you know, passed down, you know, and keep getting passed down. This is not anything that's more complicated than that. Um, Mr. Reed, um, I worked with um, uh, 
Kevin Martin, the chairman of the FCC, uh, to make sure that when we were doing the 700 megahertz uh, auction, uh, that we set aside a certain percent of it that could be bid for, but only by a company that had uh, an open architecture so that any app could go on board. Uh, and that wound up being the Android. Huh? So what role did that play in opening up the, the, uh, the app market, uh, knowing now that there was no gateway whatsoever, that you had an aperture through which you sitting at home, you know, your own little company, your own little idea, did that, did that really jet propel this uh, revolution in your mind? I think that you have to look at the ecosystem in its entirety. Um, while there's some interesting things that happened because of the 700 megahertz auction, I think what, what really, if you really look at it, what the change that, that occurred that really propelled us was the ability of our product to get in front of a consumer. No, I know that. What I'm saying with, is if you were just a smaller person, you didn't know how to negotiate with Apple, and, you know, but you just wanted to get your app out there, didn't that make it simpler for you to do so and increase by maybe 100,000 the numbers of them that could get out there almost immediately without having a gateway? I guess, I guess the reason that I, I just touched on that is I think that it's worth noting for this committee a really important part about how the platforms play a role because the problem you're describing is we didn't have a problem getting our app out. There was the Internet. I could put anything out anywhere. No, I know, you know, it was I finding a way that. to actually get it in front of people. I so I, I understand your point, but you I think it's really I'm important. understand what I'm saying, Platforms, Ms. Hay, platforms uh, yeah, matter. Uh, Mr. Ramsey, yeah. could you comment on that? Yeah, um, Congressman, I, I would say unequivocal that the principles of openness mm -hmm. right. were important and continue to be important um, for this sector and moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I would just say, that, and that was Thank one you. of the yeah. one of the key elements. And there, as you know, as you well know, there have been other issues connected to the notion of openness that continue to be important. No, and I appreciate that. That's, yeah. that's my concept. Open architecture is important, and I, you know, the iPhone was a closed architecture, okay? So that's just the bottom line. Again, at that time, okay, it gets more open as they see competition, they see all these apps going over to, you know, the other devices. Do you agree with that, Mr. Uh, Farrago? Um, I, I mean, as far as I understand the question, I, you know, I agree, I agree that it's uh, easier than it's ever been before for yeah. a small entrepreneur who's That was the goal of apps. moving over the 700 uh, megahertz. Yeah, no, no, it's been great. I mean, yeah, it's, thank you. it's a reduced barrier to entry, and I would say uh, if you compare it to the manufacturing world where you have to pay for manufacturing and distribution, you have to have a professional sales force that negotiates with Best Buy or whomever and deal with retail. How many jobs inventory. do you think the 700 megahertz created? Why? How many jobs do you think? It's, I think it's too hard to parse that. It, it's well, hard, hard give to us, is it like 25 jobs? <laughs> no, give us a magnitude, not our magnitude. How, what do you think it did? Because it, it, this, this is a committee hearing on jobs, right. and you're here testifying saying, you know, you want to create more jobs. So what did the 700 megahertz do in terms of creating more jobs so that we have some basis for knowing what our goal should be or what the objective can be? I'm happy to take that question back, and we'll sit down with smart people and come up with some numbers. I think that's important. I don't think, you know... Um, we should not answer that question because obviously that was the goal that was presented to me by your counterparts five years ago in terms of moving over that, you know, uh, spectrum and making sure it was open for, an, uh, for the, uh, an architecture that would invite hundreds of thousands of people who otherwise might never have been able to think through the maze of working in corporate America. Mr. Ramsey? Yeah, I, I would say, Congressman, again, there, there hasn't been a study of that, which I think it would be worthwhile looking at, yeah. but I would add, um, in keeping with that, that every time the FCC does an auction, it has a job implication um, connected to it. And so it is crucial, and so that was, was crucial spectrum to get out, as well as some of the next uh, in line spectrum as All well. All I'm saying is it might have created 50 or 100,000 jobs Correct. because of the openness of that architecture, and it's scattered in 50 states and 435 congressional districts because it's obviously, you know. Uh, I, uh, I can say that people have moved from iOS development to Android development because of the innovation that's possible on that open architecture. Th and I appreciate you telling us that, and, uh, and that's really what this is all about. It's, it's about uh, job creation, and we've always operated on a bipartisan basis here, you know, in order to uh, accomplish that goal, thinking it through and, you know, trying to be smart as uh, we go forward. And Mr. Cassidy and I, and I think others also have privacy concerns as we get into this uh, world deeper and deeper as well. I, I thank you, Madam Chair. 
I thank the gentleman and also look forward to seeing the text of your bill and working with you and remind the gentleman that years ago I introduced uh, an anti-spy war effort which was very much along the same lines of what you're talking no, I do. about. I, so I, appreciate I that. look forward to seeing your bill and, and working on it. Chair recognizes myself for thank five you. minutes uh, for a second round of questioning. But just to follow on Mr. Markey's line of questioning, I'm an, app, I'm, a, I'm an Apple person. It took a long time for me to convert from PC to Apple. I mean, w once I got to Apple, I, I couldn't go back. But I have chosen to be an Apple person, and I have chosen to use iTunes. Uh, and a lot of my friends are droid people. I mean, we had that choice. Uh, but to sort of counter what Mr. Markey is saying, I, I knew that there was sort of a walled garden approach in, in the App Store for Apple, yet I figured that they knew what they were doing, that they were protecting uh, both the growth of, of their platform, uh, that my app somehow had a stamp of approval from Apple, and I felt I wasn't shopping in the wild, wild west uh, of, of the open source. So I, I chose that, and that, that was my choice, my decision. Um, and I, you know, like everybody else, I guess we all play words with friends on different platforms. Uh, but I think it's important to note that uh, people made the choice, and I, I had that opportunity. But I, I just want to turn a little bit to, to Spectrum. Uh, clearly, that's very important to all of us. I was wondering if anybody wants to comment on the thinking of whether we need more licensed or unlicensed spectrum, and should it be in big blocks, and what should guide our thinking tomorrow? Do you have some questions and thoughts you'd like to see tomorrow for our big hearing? Madam Chairman, I, just, just a couple of quick things, and maybe I'll stop in now for this, uh, for this hearing tomorrow on spectrum. But um, I think it's clear that we need both licensed and unlicensed. They both play a role. Uh, in this ecosystem, and the FCC's proposals around incentive auctions, in, in my opinion, is a innovative way um, of taking a look at how we can better aggregate larger blocks of spectrum and more efficiently get it out there uh, into the marketplace. Now, obviously, that requires some give and take with 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 other folks. And then I just want to go back to what, what Senator Markey had brought up because it's too easy to commingle the words open. Um, and I don't think, um, and I, I can't speak for the congressman, he just walked out, you know, or myself when I was talking about openness. The principles of openness were not to say that, that Apple wasn't open um, because they're, they're adhering to net neutrality principles. Um, and so I think all of these platforms give consumers choice like, like the choice that you've exercised. So I don't want sort of the old fight of net neutrality and openness to be commingled with the terminology. Um, the principles of openness have continued to be adhered to by all of these platforms we're describing, whether it's, it's Facebook and Google and Apple. So they've all been doing, I think, a very good job in that regard. Mr. Reed, would you care to comment on Spectrum? I'll be really short and, and echo what he said and say, I want more and I want it now. And uh, unlicensed and licensed uh, are things that we need to work on. Licensed is really important because, bluntly put, I need guys in hard hats digging trenches, pulling fiber, and putting up towers. And so ultimately that means that I need companies that are willing to spend the money to build the infrastructure that I will be on top of. So get me there and get me there now because that's what we're going to need. Would either of you like to comment on competitiveness with Europe and what Europe is doing? Uh, and if we might la lose sort of this, this race to, uh, in, in this area, Europe, I, I guess you're, a number of European and Asian countries are bringing substantial amounts of spectrum to market uh, for commercial use. If we fail to keep pace, will we lose our, our leadership role uh, in this area? It's, if, if, I, I, yes, I don't please. mean to speak too much. Yeah, um, um, Madam Chairman, I, I would say there are a couple things we have to look at. One is obviously government itself. Um, has a lot of spectrum, and we've got to look at how efficiently that's being organized, how much the government needs so we can get that uh, online. Um, then we've got the issue of making sure we can um, acquire um, inefficiently used spectrum that broadcasters um, are, are, util are utilizing or not utilizing, and that's where the auctions come into place. We've got to get that back um, online. And then lastly, um, we will not, even with the most efficient allocation of spectrum from the government, let's say the government does everything perfect, with this explosive growth in the use of these devices, which are all using greater and greater amounts of spectrum, innovation and technology itself is going to be one of the ways we're going to get through this. Spectrum sharing, 
other sorts of forms of technology like that are going to help us get through this problem. So we're going to, this is where the private sector will continue to be important. The very companies, and this is why I was emphasizing early, that, that does not have this distinction between big and small. These so-called small are going to be relying on some of these other companies to continue to create innovation around Spectrum that's going to enable them to flourish. So at the end of the day, we are all in this together. So better allocation from the federal, from the federal government of its Spectrum, the use of technology to get that out, um, uh, taking Spectrum that's not being used smartly on the broadcasters, all of those all-in approach, all of the above approach will keep America competitive uh, uh, with that. All right. Thank you. Dr. Cassidy, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, again, the, Madam Chair just spoke of how I ch would choose to use Apple if I chose to use Apple. Another thought I have, though, is that clearly Apple can censor what is placed upon their app store. There's a, some social conservatives put something up there, boom, Apple took it off. It disagreed with their philosophy. On the flip side, I gather that they don't allow pornography. And so there is a certain censorship that takes place. Now, you could argue this is a private company, but at some point if their market share becomes so great, um, then it, does it begin to have a responsibility beyond that of a private company? And so um, I toss that out again because you guys think about this. Right. And, and, I, and I'm just going to oh. – why, why don't we start? Apple has uh, very detailed guidelines for what it accepts in the store. It's a one to two week long review process for, for most of us developers. So if we find out that something that we have done inadvertently is violating some terms and conditions, which they consistently update as well, then it's back to the drawing board. It's, it's, max, it, it's changing whatever the offending feature is. So, um, you know, it, doing business in the App Store uh, with Apple is is a is a more detailed process versus Android, where you're able to sort of explore whatever the operating system is and put it up there, and people can then choose to download it in the wild, wild west. Of now, do you see a concern though? Because again, I forget what it was, but some social conservative group put something up and it was struck down. Uh, it would have offended somebody. Uh, now, they may take down everything that's Republican, theoretically, or everything that's Democrat, and they would say, of course, no, that wouldn't happen. But again, there's one group at least that felt like it happened to them. Uh, and uh, do they become a quasi-public entity? Well, I think it's important to note that uh, uh, Android, in fact, is uh, rising to the level of having the largest market share, and they have a true wild, wild west. In fact, um, uh, some of the apps that are on there are, are problematic for us, and we've, we've – um, you know, we've talked to other folks about how do we deal with apps that might be doing something illegal or how do we get, how do we get apps that are on the completely wide open uh, atmosphere uh, in a place that we can deal with them and the police can move forward. I think, though, what's the reverse side is I'm going to be very coldly um, logical about this from my own perspective. My folks make more money on the curated store model because of what the chairman said. And that is they find the trust relationship at the curated store, whether it be Apple or the Xbox platform. Now, but that's not really that's, my concern. Right. There. But, I mean, we, so from our perspective, I like it. I like the curated store because it's small. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not arguing money. curated versus non-curated. I mean, what, oh. what is the obligation in terms of allowing free speech for something which, again, has maybe not dominant market share, but 49 percent or something like that, pretty substantial? Uh, actually, at this point in time, Apple, um, the Android has actually a larger market share globally. But, but I'm Apple, saying so that if it's 40 percent, I mean, it's still substantial. Yeah, I, I think we're 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 so far away from Apple being a public entity that I, I'm I'm not quite I'm not quite sure. I I think that a I think a private industry has the right to to keep pornography or other material off there. And off what their about platform. socially conservative views? So far. I think that's something that if, uh, if there was a major issue around that, that's something that I, I am sure Congress would bring to the attention, and I'm sure the Democrats would do likewise if, if their apps were kept off the platform as well. Um, and I think let's take that on a case-by-case. -case. When it happens, let's address it. But overall, I do think I want to preserve the right for private industry to make decisions about what they put um, in front of my kids and in front of, uh, in front of uh, adults. Ms. Fergo? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have a lot to add to, to what's already been said. I, uh, I think the way uh, we view it or I view it is um, uh, Apple and Amazon and Google are running stores like a retailer. Um, this just happens to have a digitally distributed product on a virtual store shelf. So if I go into Macy's or Bloomingdale's or Safeway grocery stores on the West Coast, I, I expect that there has been a buyer, there's been a review. There's only a little bit of a difference, if I may interrupt, because it isn't as if you can go to one Apple store versus another Apple store. There's only one Apple store. And so the, the, the paradigm is a little bit different than Dillard's versus uh, Macy's sure, but, versus Saks. But I might respectfully point out if, uh, if I use an Xbox home console, uh, Xbox Live Arcade, which is their digital platform, uh, is, is run by them. And, and if I am a Microsoft Xbox user, that's the only store from which I can purchase goods as well. A little less pervasive. The pervasiveness is the issue. Well, I, I think that, you know, um, uh, a store, uh, if it's successful and has a lot of customers coming into its large, like Walmart, uh, sized or, or even bigger, uh, I, you know, I still think they're fundamentally a private entity running a store, and they, they have a right to decide uh, which goods get on that shelf. Okay. Um, We're out of time. I agree. Yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Bass, you're recognized. No further questions? All right. Well, um, I'm just going to ask one brief question of the panel in lieu of a third, third round, um, if I might. And nobody really touched on cloud technologies and the importance. And I would just like to open up um, briefly, if we can keep this last round to two minutes or so, uh, if anybody wants to talk about, um, I think, Mr. Farago, you specifically talked about uh, what you said, the nearly endless storage cloud technology offers and how it contributes to the handheld devices now being super devices. How important is the cloud to the app world, and how important is security of the cloud to ensure consumer confidence? So last question of the day. Yeah, I mean, I, I, at a high level, they're both fundamentally, I mean, deeply important. They're critical. Um, you know, this, this device has limited storage. I mean, they are, they are really supercomputers in your pocket now. But what makes, um, what, one of the many things that make uh, this kind of experience special for consumers is that not only is there a lot of uh, data that one, you know, your picture, for example, of your, of, your, of your grandchild could be probably accessed from several different devices. It lives somewhere for you, and that's, that's a real convenience for customers. That requires storage. Uh, if you can't fit enough things in your house, then you may go get a public storage uh, locker somewhere uh, locally. And so it's just a place to, to hold more things universally uh, for consumers, uh, and then they'd like to access those. So the other piece, obviously, in between the device, the client, and the cloud is, is the, sort of the highway, the, the, the bandwidth and spectrum we've been talking about that's also critically important. Um, the security of that data is highly important, um, and consumers need to have trust that um, Apple with iCloud and, and uh, many other cloud services, Box is a very uh, popular company uh, for enterprise now, uh, Dropbox, places where you can place something and then get it later, or place something for someone else to get a file or a picture or whatever. Um, you know, you, you want to believe that uh, your property, a picture of your grandchild, is, is safe and secure, and, and so it is critically important. Thank you. Anybody care to chime in or? Yes, yes I, I think the cloud has been monumental to, to the app marketplace. The, the safety that comes from being able to use Amazon Web Services versus trying to come up with some sort of encrypted way of handling credit card numbers as an independent app developer, business owner, I mean, there's just no comparison. So now as an independent or small business owner, I'm able to leverage uh, cloud services like this, particularly in e-commerce, I think, that are, that are safe, that conform to all the guidelines that are, are required of, of protecting that sort of data. And at the same time, cost me very little. So I'm able to actually launch more products. I'm actually able to innovate more. So I think the cloud has been absolutely monumental in the economy here. All right. I think the only part I would add to bring it back to policy for a moment is we need your help, and I know this isn't the Committee of Jurisdiction that deals with it, but we need all members of Congress to help us on some of the antiquated laws that govern um, our electronic privacy uh, in the cloud, because unfortunately they go back to the era where things stored in the cloud were less valuable than stuff stored on your desktop. And the problem that it creates for us from a business perspective is when I go to a risk adverse company and I say, buy my small business created product because you can trust the cloud storage that we're using at Amazon AWS or anyone else, their answer is yes, but what is our legal responsibilities? Is it the Sixth Circuit Court? Is it ECPA? And they don't buy our product. Not because our product didn't, wasn't awesome. It was because our product, they couldn't have the legal, the legal risk 
that exists right now around some of our privacy protection laws. So we ask all members of Congress to help us as an industry with ECPA reform and making sure that we have clear, concise ways to speak to risk-adverse lawyers about why the cloud is a safe, logical place to store their data. I thank you very much. And, and that's going to conclude our, our panel, our, our hearing for the day. So I want to thank the entire panel for being with us today. You've been very gracious. We look forward to working with all of you moving forward. Uh, and uh, at this point, I'm going to remind members they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record. I ask witnesses to please respond promptly to any questions they may receive. And with that, thank you again very much. And the hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Awesome. Nice learning about what